How many of you remember being a kid? You know, for like Jimmy Phillips, that's a long time ago, so it may be a strain. But for a lot of the rest of it, it's a little bit closer. You were a kid, and when you were a little kid, the worst thing you had to worry about is whether there was a monster under the bed or not. In fact, you never worried much till bedtime, and usually then just because you were worn out. And your parents looked at your little kid worries, and they just kind of laughed and thought it was funny. And then you got to be a teenager, and your worries changed a little bit. You worried about whether that zit that popped up overnight was going to ruin the rest of your life and scar you forever. Or you could have been like me. Now, my mother is the best money manager that I have ever met. She can manage money like crazy. But part of that is because she likes to find things on sale. And so I was going into the eighth grade, and she found blue jeans on sale. And I was like, all right, new blue jeans. So she gets home, and they're plaid. <laughs> they are white blue jeans with green and red plaid all up and down the legs. And they were so cheap, she bought my brother and I each five pair. <laughs> and boy, I worried about wearing those to school. First, I worried about the immediate threat of getting beat up because I was wearing funny clothes. And then I worried that I was never going to have a girlfriend, which I didn't, so <laughs> maybe I was right. And then I worried that it just scarred me for the rest of my life, and I think I've managed to avoid that worry. But I also remember being in about the ninth grade, and I had this profound thought. I can't wait till I am an adult, and I am free. It must be wonderful to be an adult because you have nobody telling you what to do. You can do whatever you want. I got rules, 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 and I want to be free. I want to be an adult. How many of you remember feeling that way? All right. How many of you think as an adult you're free? <laughs> How many of you wish that this week the worst thing you had to worry about was the zit that pops up on your face? Yeah? Yeah. All of a sudden, we worry about things that our, our, our little kid selves didn't even think about. Because when I was a kid sitting at the table, I never worried about whether there would be food at the table the next time I sat down. I never worried about whether somebody could come and take the house away because I didn't have enough money to pay the mortgage. I never worried about whether Dad would continue to bring a paycheck home or not because his job might end. I just assumed all those things were handled. So my worries could be small worries, not big worries. When I got to be an adult, that all got turned upside down. Now all of those things that my mom and dad dealt with on my behalf, they become mine to deal with. And I have responsibility now. And with responsibility comes pressure, comes worry, comes making you tired. How many of you wish that just for one week you could go back to the level of worry you had when you were a kid? Just for one week, you didn't have to think about money, you didn't have to think about clothes, you didn't have to think about the biggest worry that you would have was, is there a monster under the bed? Just for one week, wouldn't that be wonderful? That that's the biggest problem in your life. Is there a monster under the bed? Jesus knew that as an adult, when we take responsibility, there are all kinds of pressures that come with that. The pressure comes because we feel like we are supposed to be in control. That we are supposed to be in charge. That we are supposed to handle everything. Go with me quickly to, John, uh, to Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. This passage is going to sound familiar, I think, to almost everybody in here. Matthew 20, 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's not easy to lose control. It's not easy for us to give control to somebody else. What if somebody walked up today and they were the number one money manager in the world? And they said, hand me your checkbook and all of your money and I will take care of it for you and you won't even have to think about it. At first we might say, ooh, that's great. But how many of us could really do that? How many of us could really turn everything over to somebody who walked up and said, here you go. I'm going to go do what I want to do. I'm not going to worry about it anymore. I always say we could. But how many emails would we send? Um, everything all right with my money? Hey, did you see that stock? Um, you in that one, did you? We would check in. In fact, we'd probably want a progress report every month, wouldn't we? How's my money doing? How's everything going? Because we would still hold on to the idea that we were in control. And when we decide that we need to be in control, some things happen in our life. First, we get frustrated with the unexpected. When something happens that we don't expect, it frustrates us. The second thing that happens is that we fear the unknown. And all, I, 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 it's interesting how God works things out that the scripture reading in Orville's message both dealt with people who were in situations they couldn't control. Peter's in prison, he can't control it. Most of us would worry, wouldn't we? The, the uh, Israelites are on the edge of the Red Sea. The army's coming. They can't control it. They're going to worry, right? That's what we would do. When we are proceeding to the unknown we begin to worry. And when we have the uncertain, so the unexpected, the unknown, and the uncertain all cause us problems. Because those are all three things that we can't control. If you go on into Matthew 12, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time reading Matthew 12. I'm going to try to abbreviate a little bit. As my nephew said, John, John, could you shorten it a little bit? Alright, so I'm going to try to abbreviate just a little bit. As you, as you go into Matthew chapter 12, 12 it's all about control. Jesus is talking to groups who want to have control of their life. First, they want to have control of their circumstances. But second, they want to have control of their own salvation. They want to be saved by what they do. Y'all saw John John come up here and get a Bible tonight, today. John John was just baptized. When John John came up out of that water, was he saved or not? Yeah? Was he completely saved? How long ago were you baptized, David? A long time ago. Is David still saved? Is John John just as saved as David is saved? Wait a minute. One of them was baptized recently. One of them was baptized a long, long time ago. They're both just as saved. Because God's in control of the salvation process, not us. God saves, not us. But that wasn't how they understood it. So the Pharisees started working up all of these rules to make sure they stayed on the saved side of things. And so when God said, don't work on the Sabbath day, you know what the Pharisees did? Ooh, that's kind of loose. We need to figure out what work is. If we don't know what work is, we might mess up and violate it. So they started defining what work was. So Jesus' apostles are walking through a grain field. They're hungry. They pick some grain on a Saturday, and the Pharisees get all upset. Whoop, they're working. They're working on the Sabbath day. I don't think that's what God meant when he said don't work on the Sabbath day, and neither did Jesus. Jesus walks into the house. There's a sick man there. The Pharisees look and go, uh, we got him now. You can't heal on the Sabbath day. It's work. And I mean, if we're honest about it, most of Jesus' work was healing people, wasn't it? Physically or spiritually. Jesus said that's not what God meant. He healed on the Sabbath day. Oh, the Pharisees got upset. He had worked. Because they felt like if they could control the Sabbath day, if they could control their salvation based on their interpretation of what God said, they would be all right. Salvation was not up to God. Salvation was up to them. They were going to be saved by how well they controlled what God told them. You go on in the verse and there's a passage that has caused all kinds of problems of interpretation. <clears throat> and the passage deals with the unforgivable, unforgivable sin. 
And boy, I don't know how many Bible classes I've been in where they've hit Matthew chapter 12 and everybody's going, well, we've got to define what the uh, <coughs> unforgivable sin is because we don't want to accidentally commit it. Doesn't that sound like what the Pharisees were saying about the Sabbath day? We've got to define it because we don't want to accidentally work. Well, now we've got to define... I'm going to give you what I think right now, which I'm going to preface by saying it could change you know, upon further study. <coughs> but right now, I think the unforgivable sin was trying to take control of your own life and your own salvation. Because as long as you try to be your own God, you will never acknowledge the one true God. And the Pharisees were trying to be their own God. They were trying to be their own Savior. And so they were worried about controlling all of these things. And so the unforgivable sin was they were stuck in a pattern of not acknowledging the real God. They only acknowledged their ability. And when they didn't acknowledge God, God was not going to forgive them until they turned and made Him God. That's the only thing God asks of us is to let Him be God. Let Him be God in our life. We sang the song, Jesus is Lord. That's what Lord means, is to let Him be God. It goes on and they want to see signs. You know why they wanted to see signs? <clears throat> they wanted to see more miracles. Because then they had proof in their mind. But what happened when they saw the miracles? Well, they didn't believe them. Because the miracle didn't coincide with their expectation. It's hard turning over control of our lives. I mean, let's be honest. All you adults in here, how many of you within the last month have felt weary? I mean, just weary. How many of you in the last month have felt completely frustrated with something that's bothering you that you have no control over? Yeah, it's universal, isn't it? So when Jesus stands up to these people and he says, Come to me all you who are weary, he's saying, hey, everybody, come my way. Come to me, everybody who is heavy burdened. Anybody, anybody got a burden you struggle with? He's saying, come. You know, I walked in today and I really wasn't nervous about my surgery tomorrow until about the fifth person said, you nervous about tomorrow? And I thought, well, maybe they know something I don't. Maybe I should be, you know. I'm really not. Because God's lifted that burden from me. I didn't do it. He did. He's in control. Whatever happens, it's in His hands. You see, what the emphasis is, is that God desires control in our life, not because He's mean, and not because He is angry. He desires control in our life so that we don't have to do it. I'm sure you've had this conversation with a young child. You're in the middle of a good day. Everything's going great. Everything's going fine. And the young child says, This is the best day ever. I love you so much and you love me so much. And then you turn around and you ask the child to do something they want to do. You are the meanest person ever. This is a horrible day. You are so mean. I don't like you. Well, why is the difference? The difference is an exertion of control. Okay? As long as they... And, don't tell me we don't do this with God. As long as we pray to God, God, please find the money. God, please heal the disease. God, please do this. God, please do that. And he answers our prayer the way we think he ought to. We're all like, yay, God, woo! And we say our little thing. God is good. And all the time. What we really mean is God is good when he does what we want. God is not good when he doesn't do what we want. But we say it the other way. God is good all the time. God is good when he answers the prayers the way we want them answered. And God is good when he answers the prayer differently than what we wanted. What God desires... I mean, do you really think that your parents made all of those rules they made just because they were mean and wanted to control you? No. No. They made all those rules because they wanted what was best for you. Now, as human parents, sometimes we're fallible. Sometimes the things we think are best aren't exactly best. And so we get a little frustrated uh, with our parents, maybe even for a reason. But we've got the perfect parent in God. If God says it's for our good, then it is for our good. 
like I said weeks ago, I'm trying to come up with this new saying for me. Uh, God has a plan. What it is, I don't understand, but I believe God has a plan. Okay? We have to believe that God has a plan. At the bottom of this reading we had, it says, I am gentle and humble in heart. And then he says, my yoke is easy. Now how many people know how many oxen were in a yoke in that day and time? How many oxen did they put in a yoke? Two. So if Jesus says it's my yoke, who's the other oxen in the yoke with us? Well, it's Jesus. In fact, when we're hooked up pulling the load of our life, the load of our life is pulled in tandem with Jesus. He's the other oxen in the yoke. But that word easy is what we get hung up on. Really, that word should be translated custom made. The yoke was made and fitted for a specific oxen. All right? So you got two oxen pulling this load, and the yoke is made in a way that it doesn't cause any blisters, that it doesn't cause weariness, that the load seems much lighter than if they just grabbed one off the shelf and thrown it on. In other words, God is saying to us that the yoke that we wear in this life, the burden that we pull, first off, we pull in tandem with Jesus. So when we get tired, guess what? He keeps pulling. And second, the yoke that we're wearing is a yoke that is custom made for us. It is something that God has designed for us. Which means God believes that we can carry the burden that he gives to us. And God will not give to us a burden that we cannot carry. He loves us too much. Would you ever put on your child a responsibility that you believe they were too young to handle. No, in fact, we do the opposite, don't we? What's the first thing you do when you see a young person that's grown up enough to get their driver's license besides get off the road when you see them coming? You worry whether they're up to the responsibility of having a driver's license, don't you? And when we send them off to college, what do we worry about? Are they up to the responsibility? In fact, if we could keep our kids from experiencing things two years beyond when they usually experience things, most of us parents would put it off, wouldn't we? I think the driver's license age ought to be 21. Yeah, that's a great idea. We would put it off because we tend to do the other. We tend to put off responsibility on our children longer. They can handle more sometimes than we give them credit for. God's the opposite. God makes sure that the responsibility he gives you and I, the things he gives you and I to carry in tandem with Jesus, not by ourselves, are things we can carry. Because he says the burden is light. I'm not going to load you up with stuff you can't handle. If I have given it to you, you can handle it. You can deal with it. Sometimes we get so weary because what we're doing is... Jesus is trying to pull us in this direction with the yoke, and we're trying to pull in this direction. And so as Jesus is saying, no, 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 here's the road, here's the road, we're actually pulling the opposite direction. And we get tired. Because instead of going the direction with help, we're going a direction on our own. Or sometimes we want to try to carry the load all by ourselves. Instead of letting Jesus help carry the load with us. Instead of using the strength we're promised to have. Boy, sometimes I would go back to the freedom of childhood because it would be nice to lay in bed and before I go to sleep, not pray to God about all the things that are bothering me. But the simplest prayer is, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. When you're a kid, that's all the prayer you need, isn't it? But when you're an adult and you lay down in bed and you start praying to God, you're praying, oh, Father, I don't know how I'm going to handle this. Would you please help me give this? I don't know what this is going to come from. Father, I need it. And if, you, if you're like me, the list gets like this. You can't finish it in four sentences. What I would be like to have that rest. Well, God says we can have that rest. 
the reason we rob ourselves of rest with God is we want to do what he said he will already do for us. He's guaranteed it. It's not something that is iffy. God has said, if you trust me, your burden will be light. I won't give you more than you and Jesus can pull together. I promise. I won't give you more than you and Jesus can pull together. The biggest thing we want as parents for our children is for our children to be safe and sound. Isn't it? We want our children to be safe and sound. Oh yeah, there's some other things we'd like for them to have along the way, but the biggest thing we want is for our children to be safe and sound. Do we believe we're a better parent than God is? If not, then the biggest thing God wants for us is to be safe and sound. And everything he asks us to do, pulling with Jesus, and every burden that we carry is to lead us to one place, safety in him. Jesus says, come to me, you who are weary. That includes me. Come to me, you who feel you have a heavy burden. That includes me. And I, I will give you rest. Notice he doesn't say, I'll give you rest if you're good enough. He doesn't say, I'll give you rest if you've deserved it. Deserved it. He doesn't say, I'll give you rest if you've worked hard enough. In fact, there's only one thing you've got to do to have rest. Come to him. Let him start pulling with you. Let him help you carry the burden. Let him take it. Let God be God. Let him be in control. When we can let God be in control, then we have somebody who's gentle, who's humble in heart, and we will find rest for our souls. When we don't have that rest, it's not on God. It's on us. If we start letting him take charge and realize that whatever is happening in our life, he believes that with Jesus we got this. It's a freedom like we never even knew as children. And it's a peace like we've never found in our life. If you'd like to join some of us, I'm not going to say that you're going to be 100% there the first day, okay? John John may be more there than David is some days, I imagine. But the first day, I'm not going to say you're going to be 100% there. But boy, i tell you what you can do with the rest of us. You can join the journey. Because it's a journey to learn how to rest in God. It's a journey that will be perfected the day we go to heaven. Because on the day we go to heaven, we'll have complete rest in God. What he does along the way is he helps us learn what that's going to be like. So if you want to start that journey with some of us who don't do it perfect, but boy, we're trying to learn it, then feel free to come to the back and meet them while we stand and sing.